en revistas, es, es editora de Molecular Biology, de Current Biology, de eLife, de PNAS. Entonces, eh, por mencionar algunas de sus ocupaciones, además de laboratorio. Y ha recibido también múltiples reconocimientos y solo voy a mencionar algunos. En el 2012 fue, eh, recibió el premio del NIH de, de Investigación Transformativa. En el 2016 fue fellow del MacArthur eh, eh, Association y este, en el 2019 eh, miembro de la Academia Nacional de Ciencias y después en el 2021 miembro de la Academia de Artes y Ciencias de, de América. Entonces, como ven, este, Dayan eh, ha sido reconocida en muchas, en muchas instancias por su trabajo. Y básicamente ella resume en su, en su biosketch cinco líneas de investigación donde claramente ha he hecho contribuciones importantes en todas ellas. Eh, y una, la, la principal es este, estudiar principalmente el papel de los metabolitos secundarios en la sobrevivencia y desarrollo de los microorganismos. Eh, la otra importante es este, Entender las actividades microbianas en el contexto de las enfermedades para encontrar nuevas aproximaciones de tratamiento. Eh, y estudiar eh, fósiles moleculares eh, en microorganismos que también han dado un nuevo conocimiento y un nuevo giro al área de entender la evolución en, 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 a través de estos eh, metabolismos de estos organismos y e identificar el arsenal respiratorio que, con el que cuentan un montón de bacterias. Y algo de lo más interesante es modelos nuevos para estudiar genética en bacterias, lo cual también ha permitido grandes contribuciones. Y bueno, si ven su, su CV, en cada una de estas áreas ha contribuido y publicado en revistas muy prestigiosas. Y nuevamente, Dayan, muchas gracias por haber por aceptado la invitación y por estar acá. Gracias a usted, Gustavo y a Christian. Y um, quiero decir que he tenido un día muy divertido, especialmente con uh, mis compañeros aquí, <ríe> David, Hanna, Víctor y Rogelio. ¿Sí? <ríe> Entonces, gracias por uh, um, mostrarme un tiempo muy um, interesante y muy divertido. Estoy muy um, feliz de estar aquí y muy uh, Orgullosa de ha uh, sido invitada. <laughs> okay, I'm going to now switch to English uh, because I cannot do this all in Spanish. And I'm going to violate one of the most important lessons I told the students this morning, which was to always pick the simplest possible system or even the simplest possible language to describe your science. And I'm going to start with a really difficult word. Um, but the reason I'm using this word is kind of amusing. Uh, during COVID, one of my friends spent every day picking a new word from the Oxford English Dictionary that he would send to his friends, his pen pals by email. And he would ask each of us to give him a number. And then he would take our number and go to the page of the number and choose a new word to expand our vocabulary. And on the day that I gave him my number, he gave us back this word which is from the ancient Greek. It's pronounced agathokakological. So agatho means of good, kako means of evil, and agathokakological means composed of good and evil. And I immediately resonated with this word. I loved it because what I realized is that it very much captured what I find most fascinating about the subject that has entranced me for the past two decades, which is the dual functionality of a class of metabolites that are made by many thousands of different bacterial species that we find in nature and also in disease. And what I hope to share with you is how our studies over the past couple of decades 
looking at one model system and one specific class of these metabolites has taught us lessons that I believe have enriched our ability to understand what these types of molecules do for the organisms that make them and how that understanding can lead us to ways to better control them in contexts that we care about. And so I begin with this very pretty picture. I don't know if you recognize this. It's supposed to be, what is this? The Scream by Edvard Munch, a very iconic painting. But to me, when I look at this, it's not obvious this is a scream. I think it could equally well be an expression of joy, right? And so it's ambiguous. Is it evil? Is it good? We don't know. It might be one or the other, depending upon the context. <laughs> um, but what I do know for sure is that this beautiful work of art is rendered with bacteria from the soil. And so this was made by a Croatian microbiologist by the name of Tomislav Ivankovic, who heard me give a talk at a seminar once, and he sent me this image and he gave me permission to use it in all of my talks. <laughs> and so I am, and I love it. Um, because what you can see is the vast diversity of pigments that are made by microbes. And if you look at it carefully, you can notice that some of them adhere very tightly to the organisms that make them, whereas others are much more able to diffuse into the auger. And if I had a movie of this plate, what you would see is that for some of these compounds, they also change color over time. And that's the part that really interests me. Why do bacteria change color? What uh, does that mean? And I'm going to focus on a particular color change that is produced by my favorite organism, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which makes redox active metabolites called phenazines. And here's what happens. You can get it to change color in this tube just by vortexing it. And when it sits over time, it becomes yellow. And now if we vortex it again, it will become blue. And the reason this is happening is because of this metabolite, which is called pyocyanin. So the bacteria, biosynthesize this reduced form that's colorless. And when we aerate it by vortexing, we introduce oxygen, which can react with this reduced form. And then these electrons from pyocyanin are transferred to the oxygen. They make superoxide. And then the molecule gets oxidized and it turns blue in its oxidized state. And then it's taken back up by the organism and the cycle begins again. So we also call this an extracellular electron shuttle, because it's going back and forth, in this case, between the cell that reduces it, and then an extracellular oxidant, in this case, molecular oxygen, and it's shuttling many times. All right, so for a very long time, pyocyanin has been thought of as a virulence factor, and indeed it is in the presence of oxygen, because it makes superoxide, which can react with all sorts of things in the cell and cause harm. And for this reason, it has been known as an antibiotic. However, back almost 100 years ago, a pioneering Swiss medicinal chemist by the name of Ernst Friedheim was doing studies in the laboratory of Leonor Michaelis, as in the Michaelis-Menten equation, if you might know from biochemistry. And what Ernst Friedheim recognized was that in the absence of oxygen, these molecules could actually have what he called accessory respiratory functions, that they would allow dense suspensions. He was actually adding them to eukaryotic uh, tumors of rat tumors. And he was showing that it was basically extending the depths to which these tumors were able to have metabolic activity. And so he was way ahead of the game in thinking that they actually might be doing something important uh, for biology. However, his insights were rapidly forgotten because just a few uh, years later came the critical discoveries of the 20th century that focused attention on the antibiotic properties of lots of you know, natural products that were made by bacteria from the soil. Most notably, here's the discovery of Sir Alexander Fleming of penicillin uh, that is inhibiting the growth of this bacterium. It's being released by this fungus. And this type of work carried forth by many investigators, including uh, Salman Waxman in the United States, who discovered streptomycin, 
really launched the golden age of antibiotic discovery. And people focused on these molecules because of their antibiotic properties. And yet, this activity is taken completely out of the natural context, right? So pharmaceutical companies today take these natural products and then they derivatize them, they change them, and they become the drugs that we use in the clinic. And they're incredibly important. However, it wasn't even clear back then that these molecules were acting as antibiotics in nature. And that wasn't demonstrated until several decades later. And the person who showed it was Dr. Linda Tomashow at the US Department of Agriculture. And she did it in this pioneering paper in the late 1980s. And along with her colleague, David Weller, they were looking at what protected wheat from destruction by a fungal pathogen. And they were able to actually demonstrate that in this particular case, the antibiotics that served as the biocontrol agents that protected the wheat from the fungus were being made by soil bacteria. And so it wasn't until this demonstration that any antibiotic was actually shown to be an antibiotic in situ, which I think is actually a very profound discovery and she deserves more credit than she's received. Anyway, you can see this evidence here where you have a kernel of wheat being colonized in white by the fungal pathogen. Here in the presence of a biocontrol strain, you do not get the colonization. Um, however, if you delete the phenazine biosynthesis genes, then the fungus is able to colonize. Okay, so that was a very nice demonstration that this compound and this particular derivative is called phenazine carboxylic acid is the causative agent uh, that inhibits take haul disease by wheat. Now, we have been interested in these molecules for some time. And in uh, the past few years, we've started collaborating with Linda to actually see how widespread these antibiotics are in global soils. And we want to understand more about what they're actually doing in situ. Are they acting only as biocontrol agents or are they also doing other things? And so together with uh, her group, a former postdoc of mine, since this is a genomics crowd, you'll appreciate this. We scanned all of the available metagenomes for the phenazine biosynthesis genes that were available at the time. And we plotted the estimated percentage of bacteria present in any site that were capable of making phenazines. And what we found, what you'll see is the text here doesn't matter. The pattern that matters is that you see an enrichment um, over 0.25% um, in these green samples. And those green samples are taken from the rhizospheres of lots of different crops, including corn, including soybean, including citrus. And this makes sense because we know that many of the classic phenazine producers are ones that like to inhabit the rhizosphere because they're getting carbon from the plant roots. But what we hadn't appreciated until we did the study was just how common these bacteria are. We find them in every soil sample we've looked at. Phenazine production is a very widespread global trait, which makes it really interesting to study. And so in wanting to study it at the level that I think is most relevant for the bacteria themselves, we have to come up with ways to actually think about what's going on at the micro scale in the microenvironment. And so we've been developing methods in the past few years in my laboratory to allow us to do this um, with higher resolution. So there are two contexts that we've worked on over the years. Um, one is this rhizosphere context, and I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. But something very important to know is that many of the opportunistic pathogens that infect people who have chronic infections, such as those with pulmonary disease like cystic fibrosis, actually come from the soil. You know, they're opportunistic pathogens that have evolved in this habitat, interacting often with plants and other microbes, you know, that are present in the soil by the plant. But it's occasionally the jumping of a microbe from this habitat into the human host that winds up causing a problem. But what I'm going to argue is that at the scale of the microbe, it's not clear to the microbe whether it's in a biofilm near the root of a plant. Here you're looking at, this is a section of a corn root. These are the root hairs. And here you see in green, these aggregate biofilms that are found. Or if we now zoom in and we look at what's happening inside uh, the cystic fibrosis lung, 
What you find is you can zoom in and you can find similar aggregates of Pseudomonas. Now I took away the mucus in blue, you see the human neutrophils, the immune system. And if I now take away the human neutrophils, what you'll notice is just the bacteria, and these are polymicrobial infections. Nevertheless, you still find aggregates that are fairly large, hundreds of microns in diameter. And you find these same aggregates also present in the rhizosphere. So if you're an organism that is present in one of these aggregates, the question is, how are you surviving? And what I'm going to argue is that phenazines are part of the solution that allows these organisms to persist, whether they're coming in the context of the soil or inside an opportunistic infection of a human. All right. So let's start with a simple question, which is just how fast might these organisms be growing? Okay, and that so sounds like a simple question, but it's actually a very challenging one to answer if you want to do it quantitatively. And so I'm at an institute that is very collaborative, where we're able to work with colleagues from different parts of the institute. And so in collaboration with geochemists, my lab was able to adapt a method from the earth sciences to be able to take an isotopic approach to quantify the doubling time of organisms in a complex sample. And so in this case, what you're looking at is a sample taken from the mucus that is expectorated by a patient who has cystic fibrosis. And what we've done is we've incubated that mucus in deuterated water. So that's isotopically spiked water with a heavy deuterium. Okay, that's what the H2 is, that's deuterium. And what we ask is after a half an hour, how much of that labeled water is incorporated into the biomass of the cells? And we can actually quantify that with a secondary ion mass spectrometer. And what we do is we couple that to fluorescent in situ hybridization to figure out what cells we're looking at. Okay, so here is a picture of two different aggregates very close by. We are identifying them as a particular pathogen we know is important in this habitat. And in this column, we're actually just using a positive control of ions of carbon and nitrogen they should all have. Now, here's the interesting part. When we look at which of these aggregates has taken up the deuterium, we only see activity in this bottom one. However, these are so close. And so what we can do is this is just a qualitative view, but we can actually get very quantitative and we can um, measure how much deuterium is actually present in each of these cells. And when we do that, we can take that amount of deuterium that's been taken up and we can convert it into a growth rate. And this was work done by my former student, Sebastian Kopf, who's now leading his own group at UC Boulder. So here, what you're looking at is the growth rate and each of these individual tick marks is a single cell that we were able to quantify its growth rate. And we we're doing this from four different patients and now what we're doing is this is the density distribution function, just giving you a sense of how many of these cells are growing at rates that are on the right-hand side on the order of doublings once every few hours versus on the left-hand side, doublings almost once a year, all right? So this is a major time difference from the left to the right. And there are two things that I want you to recognize. One is that they're growing at very different rates, right? Some of them are really fast, others are really slow. The second important thing is that if we take the average growth rate, it's pretty slow. It's less than two days. The great news for this generation of young students is that studying the physiology of bacteria growing at these rates is now possible. It didn't really used to be experimentally tractable. I would say not even, you know, 10 years ago, it was still pretty hard to really understand mechanistically how bacteria are able to sustain these slow growth rates at the molecular level. But technologies have very much improved that allow us to gain insight into this slow pace of life. So there's a tremendous amount we have to learn about how it is that bacteria operate slowly. And one motivation to do that is because of the fact that a lot of standard antibiotics that are given in the clinic have been developed to target bacteria that are growing quickly, that divide once every 20 minutes. But if they're dividing once every two days, every week, many of these antibiotics simply don't work. They're tolerant. 
And so we need a better, deeper, fundamental understanding of what sustains life in the slow lane in order to appreciate life, number one, but number two, have insights that are then going to translate into better ways of controlling these organisms. All right, so why are they growing so slowly? What's limiting them? Um, well, the answer to that can be lots of different things, and it really will vary depending upon the context. But in many cases, and I would argue this is really, I think, fair to say, both for the environment of the rhizosphere and also the environment in the cystic fibrosis lung, they're not limited for carbon. They have plenty of uh, nutrients. What they're limited for is oxygen, ironically, even though it's in the lung where you know we breathe, at the scale of the microbes that are living in a lot of mucus that's collecting in the lung, at their scale, they're not seeing any oxygen. And that's because oxygen is being consumed by cells in these aggregates faster than it can diffuse into the middle. And so this creates for the cells in the middle like a existential crisis where they're struggling, they're trying to get nutrients, but all around them, their friends are taking it down before they have a chance. And so what do they do? Um, well, this morning I showed the class that they don't just die. I mean, that could be one solution. They just give up the ghost, but they don't. They actually remain alive. And so the question is, how are they handling this? So we figured what better way to find out than to ask them to tell us what they're doing. And so we developed a couple of years ago a method that would allow us to um, see visually at the scale of single cells what genes they were expressing in situ. And so here's a demonstration of the proof of concept where uh, this method was pioneered by Daniel Dar, a former postdoc in my lab, now at the Weizmann Institute in Israel. And he and his wife, who was a technician in my colleague Long Kai's laboratory, adapted a method called sequential fish, which my colleague Long Kai had developed to study spatial transcriptomics in eukaryotes. And they adapted it to be able to work in bacteria. And so this was really um, fantastic because for the first time we were able to take our genome and we started by taking our 100 genes that are, were of greatest interest to us. And we designed probes to be able to visualize the expression of each of those genes in each of these cells as they formed a biofilm. And the critical piece here was to be able to really do the computational analysis to segment the cells and to be able to accurately count the expression of each of these genes in a way that would allow us to separate different cell states. And so that's what we were able to do. So now let me give you just some representative data. So here you see the biofilm that has established after 10 hours. If we now color each of these cells with a different color that is a manifestation of their expression profile, you get what we call the UMAP, which is, stands for the Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection, which is a statistical algorithm that allows us to take the expression patterns that we see and convert them into a phenotypic space. All right, now this I think is very attractive, but I find it impossible to interpret. There's just too much going on. So if I separate my three favorite U maps and just show you, it becomes a little more clear that you start seeing different patterns. For example, the yellow clusters are in the cells where there's greatest density, and then we see those red ones spread sort of all around. If I take a raw read, just as an example of one gene, this is a gene encoding the near S enzyme, which is in the denitrification pathway. So this is a pathway bacteria turn on when they're running out of oxygen and they start using other electron acceptors like N oxides. Here you see evidence that this gene is being expressed and that makes sense uh, as part of a cluster of cells uh, where they would likely be starting to experience oxygen limitation. If I now take my favorite genes, the phenazine biosynthesis genes, here, however, you see a different pattern. They're all over this field. And this also makes sense because what other people have uh, demonstrated before my lab even started studying phenazines is that they are regulated in part by sensing cell density, especially by quorum sensing. So if you plot just in a batch culture, the growth of a phenazine producer like Pseudomonas over time, what you see is that as it's starting to end exponential phase and transition into stationary phase, 
This is the period of time when the phenazines start being made. And simultaneously, this is when oxygen is running out in the culture. So they sense that they're getting to a high cell density. This correlates with oxygen uh, becoming depleted. And so that led us to a hypothesis, which is that maybe there's a role for these phenazines in helping these cells survive at this phase of their life cycle where oxygen is limited, but they still have plenty of carbon. Okay. So we began to do experiments basically at this step where most people end their experiments. That's actually where we started our experiments, was at high cell density. And we did it under anaerobic conditions. And so we had to move our cultures into a glove box chamber where we grew them in a device where we had an electrode that was capable of reoxidizing the phenazine. Okay, and so in the beginning of the talk, I showed you the cycle where we would add oxygen and it would regenerate the phenazine. You can do the same thing if you poison an electrode at a potential that will oxidize the phenazine. And so that allowed us to ask the question, if they're cycling the phenazine, are they able to survive? And that is what we found. So here you see an experiment where we're using a mutant that can't make its own phenazine, and we give back uh, an amount of pyocyanin that is the type of typical concentration you will find in various habitats of interest in the real world. And if you turn on the electrode and you sample from this culture, you will be able to get viable cells keeping on going for at least a week. If you take away the phenazine or you turn off the electrode so they can't recycle it, then they die. And so what this is telling us is that these phenazines, if they can be recycled, are helping sustain anaerobic, slow anaerobic growth. And so over many years, we've looked into how it is this actually happens. So now I'm just describing and summarizing um, the pathway that allows them to be able to conserve energy from this process. And the solution, let me first compare it to fast growth. This is what we're doing right now in our mitochondria, right? So we're still being able to burn the carbon that we have eaten from lunch or from uh, afternoon tea um, in our electron transport chain because the carbon has been oxidized and transferred its electrons to NADH, which then puts them into the electron transport chain. And ultimately they make their way to oxygen where they reduce oxygen to water. And in the process, they translocate protons. And this is how the ATP synthase is able to do oxidative phosphorylation. In this case, however, something very different is happening, which is that the phenazines, once they're made, are expelled from the cell via a transport system, which is the same type of transporter that will expel many antibiotics. And when they're extracellular, in natural environments, of course, there isn't an electrode, but there's either oxygen or there are iron minerals, they get reoxidized and then they get taken back up. And then they interact with different enzymes in the cell. Some of them can be in the electron transport chain. Some of them can be inside. We won't go into all of that. But the point is that when this happens, they allow NADH to get reoxidized. And this then opens up a pathway that enables substrate level phosphorylation to occur. So ATP to be made here um, within the cytosol. And in fact, the way these organisms are able to generate a proton motor force around their membrane is by doing the reverse of what happens um, during aerobic respiration. They wind up hydrolyzing ATP and pumping protons out. And so this is a completely different mode of growth, and it sustains doubling times that are much slower on the order of days. And so we're very excited about this because we think, as I'm going to show you, there's reason to believe that this might be a very common way that organisms in different natural contexts are able to sustain the slow growth rates that we are able to measure. Okay, so let me um, tell you now in the remaining time uh, two stories uh, that illustrate the agathocacological nature of these phenazines. And I'm going to start with a story that focuses only on Pseudomonas and only on its process of biofilm development. And I'm going to tell you how over the course of biofilm development, phenazines play very different functions that are essential for the fitness of the species over time. All right.
So my lab and many others uh, have been studying biofilm development by Pseudomonas aeruginosa because it's very important in um, the context of chronic infections, both for people with cystic fibrosis, but also for lots of other uh, clinical problems where Pseudomonas forms biofilms on implanted medical devices. Uh, millions of people are affected by this, and it's really of great interest to be able to think of new ways to manage biofilm development um, in order uh, to help patients who are infected with this opportunistic pathogen. What we found quite some time ago is that if we take a mutant that is unable to make phenazines, it changes its ability to make a biofilm. In fact, it obliterates its ability to build up a thick biofilm. So here you see the wild type making these nice big mushrooms. These are attaching to a piece of glass and we have medium washing over it. And so over time they form these multicellular aggregates that we call biofilms. If we get rid of phenazine production, they actually have to colonize the surface. They're unable to make these big towers. The students saw another example of this earlier today. This is at a different scale, but it's the same phenotype. If we add back pyocyanin, it then complements, it restores the ability to make these thicker biofilms. If we take a look at any of these wild type biofilms and zoom in closer, here in this panel, we see the cells that are expressing a constitutive fluorescent protein. If we take the same field of view and we add a stain that is able to visualize extracellular DNA, we see when we do an overlay that qualitatively there's a lot of DNA in these biofilms. Why? Where does it come from? What function does it serve? Well, to summarize now ideas from a variety of labs, um, it had been established prior to my group's work by Cynthia Whitchurch and others that early on, the release of DNA provides a scaffold upon which bacteria can climb and begin to form what we call microcolonies. We later demonstrated that early on when cells are beginning to attach to a surface and grow and divide, when there's sufficient oxygen in this microenvironment, and they start producing these phenazines, you wind up having toxicity for 10% of the population. And they lyse and they release some DNA. So these contribute to lysis. But as time goes on, and as these microcolonies become much larger, what happens is oxygen concentrations wind up going to zero inside the colony. And what happens at this point is that the DNA starts to play a very different role. And so a group um, in Australia, Mike Manfield's group and my lab, simultaneously came to the similar idea that it could be at this stage of development that this extracellular DNA was actually helping keep the phenazines present in the biofilm so that they wouldn't diffuse away. And why is that? All right. Well, one reason is that if they were just going to diffuse, um, then we'd lose our internal electron acceptor. They wouldn't have something that they could uh, be able to use to keep redox balance within the cell. Um, and if they diffused these phenazines, you know, they wouldn't be able to permit recycling, period. And so my student Scott Saunders asked the question, what are the concentrations of phenazines in these biofilms and how are they retained? And then he asked the question, how quickly are they recycled? And is their recycling rate faster than their loss to the environment? So these were challenging questions to actually be able to resolve quantitatively, but I'll show you how he did it. So he began with a simple experiment where he grew biofilms as a colony on the surface of auger, and he separated them by a membrane that he was then able to lift off and then extract the biofilm fraction and the auger below and quantify using LC mass spec the concentrations of these three primary phenazines made by Pseudomonas originosa. And what I want you to appreciate is that in yellow is where the phenazines are found in the biofilm and in blue in the auger. What you can see for this phenazine, which is the precursor phenazine to these other two, is that there's no preference. They partition equally well. Um, they're at the same abundance. 
However, for these phenazines, phenazine carboxamide and pyocyanin, they are found in much greater amounts in the biofilm fraction. And this correlates with the fact that this phenazine here is an anion, it's negatively charged, whereas these are neutral at the pH of the biofilm. And they also have different redox potentials. When we measured, just biochemically, the affinity of these three phenazines for double-stranded DNA, um, what we were able to find were their um, KDs, and that's what I'm showing you here in blue. And those correlated very nicely with the retention ratio of these three molecules in the biofilm relative to the agar. So that's just a correlation. It doesn't demonstrate that the DNA is causing the retention. So we did a bunch of experiments to probe that. We added ethidium bromide, which is an even better DNA intercalator, and that outcompeted these phenazines. And so that reinforced the idea. We did another experiment that I'm gonna show you, which was to ask, well, what else in the matrix might be able to bind the phenazines? Um, others prior to us had shown that there were really only two polymers in the matrix. There was the DNA polymer, and then there was a polysaccharide called PEL. Um, and if we were able to make a mutant that couldn't make this polysaccharide, and we still found them being retained, then that would really support the idea that they're interacting with the DNA. And that's exactly what we found, was that when we looked at a mutant that couldn't make this PEL polysaccharide, not only was retention really statistically not affected for these two phenazines, but it was even better for the phenazine pyocyanin. Okay, so I'll get back to that in a little bit. However, at this point, we were really uh, quite convinced that eDNA was the key in vivo exo polymer that was responsible for uh, phenazine retention. So this then emboldened us to ask a more outlandish question, which is, might the DNA be doing anything other than just holding the phenazines in the biofilm? Could the DNA be facilitating the metabolism um, via electron transfer support. And the idea for this came from interactions with my colleague, Jackie Bardem, who recently retired, but for her career, spent her uh, lab's efforts studying what's called DNA charge transfer, which is the following. If you have a piece of DNA, and if in this case, we're going to simplify it, this is just an in vitro experiment, and link it, uh, to an electrode where it is separated from the electrode by a uh, background polymer that I haven't drawn that prevents the DNA from touching the electrode. And if at the end of this double-stranded piece of DNA, we covalently add a phenazine, in this case, we're adding phenazine carboxamide because it was synthetically easiest to derivatize. What we can do is we can play games, electrochemical games with this electrode and ask, how is current flowing to the phenazine depending upon what potential we set at the electrode? And what Jackie's group has showed is that with DNA that's well-matched, you get fast electron transfer at a distance through the DNA. But if you make a mismatch, then that will attenuate electron transfer. So what that predicted is that we should see a lot of current going to the phenazine for the well-matched strand, but we wouldn't see as much going if it was mismatched, and we shouldn't see anything at all if there was no phenazine in the system, right? And so that's what you're looking at here is current as a function of the potential that we're controlling at this electrode. So when we make the potential much more reducing going from left to right, we're basically putting electrons into the system and we're seeing a lot of flow because in this case, oxygen is present that's able to rapidly regenerate this phenazine so it can accept almost an infinite amount of electrons from the electrode. So you get this big sweep here in the current for the well-matched. For the mismatched, where we also, in both cases, there's PCN at the end, it is attenuated. And now here for a case where we are doing this experiment with the control without PCN uh, that's uh, ligated on, we do not see any electron transfer. So that was exciting, but it's a very far cry from demonstrating that in the biofilm, that's what's going on. That's a much harder thing to, to prove. So my student, Scott, was emboldened to ask, well, can we measure extracellular electron transfer through this matrix in the actual biofilm? 
And he did many experiments. I'm not going to show you all of them, but here he is with his reactors where we cultivate our biofilms within them under the flow of nitrogen gas, so we keep everything anaerobic. And if you look into the reactor, we've dropped in an, a very fancy electrode that we call an interdigitated electrode array, or an IDA for short. And this was something that was designed by another collaborator of mine, Lenny Tender, an excellent electrochemist who used to be at the um, Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, DC. And so this electrode works as follows. There are two different ones. There's the generator electrode and the collector, and they interdigitate. Like I'm the arms, the generator and the collector, and then my fingers um, are extensions of the electrode so that you have a lot of surface area here at this part right there, and that's over which the biofilm can form. So it allows you to amplify any signal of electron transfer between these electrodes that you're measuring. And so if we take a look at it, this is what it looks like when it comes out of these reactors. There's a ton of biomass. And so in red, you see the cells. And in blue, you see now the eDNA. And it's like modern art. It's uh, very heterogeneous. And nevertheless, we can treat it as a material. And we can begin to do experiments with it to understand its electron transfer properties. I'm only going to show you um, one example of the data. First, let me actually zoom in and show you what you're looking at. So here on the surface, now you're looking at these individual electrodes and the gap between them at the surface. If you just go 10 microns up, you start to see the same kind of biofilms that I showed you before. And now if we zoom in even more, you can see the individual cells, and they're all bound within this eDNA matrix, all right? So we can ask in this system, if we turn on only one of these electrodes, the collector, and if we give electrons in the form of food, organic carbon to the biofilm, can we measure a current at this collector that is diagnostic for phenazine being the agent of electron transfer? And so that's what we did. So here's the collector, here we give them food, and we're asking, do we see a signal of current that is specific for the phenazine? And the answer is yes. So here we're looking at current over time. And in the wild type, we see this slow and steady, sort of almost like a heartbeat of metabolism rising and falling. And the reason it's going up and down is because the temperature in the room is changing over that exact time scale. And that's very reassuring because metabolism, we know, of course, responds to temperature. When we do a more convincing experiment is we make a mutant that is unable to make phenazines, and then we don't see any current at all. But if we provide back phenazine to this, then it restores the ability to still do metabolism. So we did many other electrochemical tests, and I won't show you in detail, but I will give you the punchline, which was we wanted to ask, is the extracellular electron transfer that's happening through this biofilm, is that rate, which we call the apparent rate of uh, diffusion in the system of the electron, is it faster than the loss of pyocyanin from the biofilm? And we have different ways we can measure these. And the answer is yes. And so here you're looking at the diffusion coefficient of the effective DAP, the EET rate, if you will, compared to the rate of phenazines that are just being lost from the biofilm. And it is about 50 times uh, greater. And so if you divide the apparent diffusion constant from the loss rate, that is a measure of EET efficiency. So from electrochemistry, we know this is theory that has been um, very well established in the field of electrochemistry, that this apparent diffusion constant is a function potentially of two things. One of the physical diffusion constant through the biofilm, and the other of a component we call self-exchange, which can inc include amongst reactions that fall into this category, DNA charge transfer. So the question now that we haven't yet answered is whether or not the fact that we have uh, D app being apparently higher than the loss of phenazine from the biofilm, is that because um, we have a significant proportion of electron transfer due to some kind of self-exchange process? Or 
is it actually the fact that really what's dominating the system is just physical diffusion in the biofilm? And the reality is that the loss from the biofilm, that rate, is not the same as the diffusion within it. And that's actually what I think is happening. We can get into more detail later, but um, the evidence that we have accumulating is that really physical diffusion within this system is the critical mechanism of electron transfer. And what the DNA is doing primarily is slowing it down, that that's the dominant effect it has. So um, for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, skip a few slides and um, get to why do we care about this? Um, because maybe some of these details of electron transfer, you know, they're interesting to me, but maybe not quite as fascinating to the rest of you. And so I think we can actually all find um, the potential application of this knowledge to be of interest, which is that, as I told you from the beginning, controlling pseudomonas biofilms is a very important clinical goal because many antibiotics really don't work well. And so we're looking for novel ways. So one initial idea we had is, can we leverage these insights, these electrochemical insights, to begin to think creatively about how to control infections? Like if you had an electronic bandage, could it help you heal a chronic wound? So one very beginning step towards answering that comes from the data that I'm about to show you uh, that was performed by Fernando Jimenez, our collaborator in Lenny Tender's lab. So here, what you're looking at is a system where she has grown the bacteria now uh, to form biofilms. And she's able to do it in an anaerobic system where she can control the potential of the electrodes um, upon which uh, she's allowing them to develop. And so here, when she has a system where she poises the potential of that electrode at a level that allows phenazines to be recycled, we see a lot of biofilm development, all right? That's consistent with what we've found before. Now, however, if she changes the potential so that the phenazine can no longer be recycled, what we see is a profound diminishment in the biofilm forming. What is really exciting uh, for us is that when you compare what happens to a biofilm where you add gentamicin, a very important clinical drug given um, to combat Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Normally, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> you can see that here. There's really no effect. The number of colony forming units per square centimeter, they're indistinguishable, right? This is the problem. Antibiotics just don't work very well. However, when we now add that antibiotic and at the same time we poise the potential um, so that phenazines cannot be recycled, now we get an even more significant drop in the viable cells. And so this is a very uh, striking phenotype that has a lot of promise. And there's a lot more to understand about why the synergy is what it is. We can discuss that later. But it gives hope that maybe there are some approaches that are going to be of use in, in biofilm control. However, an approach like this isn't going to help someone who has an infection in their lung. You can't stick an electrode down the pulmonary system. So we wanted to look for other things. So for my biochemistry uh, motivated friends in the audience, the slide is for you. So Hannah, <laughs> what we did is we went to a part of the Caltech campus. This is a former postdoc of mine, Kyle Costa. And we were wanting to find a new molecular weapon to be able to sequester phenazine that we could add to block biofilm development. And we thought if we could only grow on a plate um, an organism from the soil that had evolved in the presence of other phenazine producers to eat the phenazine as a food, then we might be able to find an enzyme that could degrade phenazine. And so uh, here you see the start of this experiment which is one that I actually began one winter when I just designed a medium where I presented the only food source was the phenazine and we got an organism to grow. And so then Kyle took that organism and developed a genetic system and then was able to figure out what machinery it needed in order to degrade. And to make a long story short, he focused in on the product of a single gene, a 15 kilodalton protein that forms this beautiful trimeric structure, you see these barrels, and down each of the barrels is in the middle there, those are the phenazine molecules that bind. And we actually um, did a lot of biochemistry that I'm not going to share right now, but we understand the mechanism of how it is that these enzymes are able to bind pyocyanin and, and transform it. 
And so that provided us with the ability to actually rationally engineer and redesign this protein. Um, so Rogelio, that part is for you, um, into a form that was solid as a rock, that was very stable, that um, you can beat this protein up any which way you think of. You can put it in the minus 80 freezer, you can heat it, you can do this and that, it's salt, whatever, and it still retains its activity. And the reason is because it doesn't have a cofactor other than its substrate. It's amazing. And so um, this was work we were able to do in collaboration with Sorel Fleischmann's group at the Weizmann Institute. They're experts in rational protein design. And, and we were able to change certain residues to really make it very robust. And so with this in hand, we could add it to see if it is able to disrupt biofilm development. And because we knew the molecular mechanism, we could make site selective mutations as controls that wouldn't have the activity. Okay, and so I'm gonna end uh, with this data. So going back to where I started at the beginning, we have these polymicrobial infections. We want to be able to model them at the scales that simulate what they look like in vivo. And so we do this by using a medium that compositionally mimics the um, chemical makeup of the sputum that we find in pulmonary infections of people with cystic fibrosis. And we take that medium and we solidify it and allow organisms, um, in this case, just pseudomonas right now, to form what we call aggregate biofilms that wind up having the very same size as we see in an actual clinical sample. Okay, so this is about as close as we can get outside of the you know, human host to be able to mimic it in the laboratory. So after we let them develop, then we treat them with a drug and we then look and image them to see what happens. And so here's the picture, all right? So if you take this auger block, and if you now compress the Y dimension, and you're now looking just at the Z and the X, and you folded the Y into it, the brightness that you see is showing you where the cells are. The more bright they are, the worse off they are, all right? If we add our phenazine oxidative demethylase called pod A, on its own, very little is happening here. If we add tobramycin, which is the most important antibiotic given to pseudomonas in the clinic, it is killing cells at the top where there's oxygen. If we now add our phenazine demethylase and tobramycin together, we see much more killing throughout the column. And we can actually quantify this by looking at the colony forming units as a direct measure of viability from these auger blocks. And so you can see that there's really a significant synergy uh, over an order of magnitude that we get in the presence of removing the phenazine. And if we do a control with a mutant form of this enzyme that doesn't have the catalytic residue, uh, then there's no effect. And so it's indeed critical because it's knocking out the ability to make the phenazine. So from this, I think I've given an example of how um, Beginning with uh, interest in what are antibiotics, you know, really doing for the cells that produce them and thinking about them at the scales that are relevant for their producers. Um, we've been able to enrich our awareness of the various functions physiologically they play. And this has given us access to being able to control a slower mode of metabolism that's very relevant for how life survives, whether it's in the rhizosphere or within an infection. And I think that given the time, I'm going to stop. I have more I could say, but I think less is sometimes more. <laughs> and so what I wanna do is end um, with this slide here um, that being, brings me back to my theme, which is I've been telling you a story about a particular class of redox active metabolites called phenazines. But what is I think more important to recognize is that this is the tip of the iceberg, that there are literally thousands upon thousands of natural products made in nature that you find in many different habitats, whether they're in the marine environment, inside a human host, on the surface of a plant, you know, or in freshwater sediments. And that there are many nuanced functions that these molecules play for the organisms that produce them, as well as for the organisms in their vicinity. And I think that uh, as we learn more about these molecules and their producers by paying close attention to recapitulating 
the actual context that we find these organisms really inhabiting, um, the better able we will be to understand how they survive and then be able to control them as we seek. So that's the uh, end. And this is a photograph of my current group. I've been acknowledging people as I've gone. And again, I just want to say um, many, many thanks for having me here to Cuernavaca. It's been a wonderful day. And now I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Eh, las personas que están en Zoom y YouTube pueden escribir sus preguntas en el chat y aquí las leemos. Preguntas. Diane, thank you so much for such a beautiful talk. Um, from what you mentioned, it appears that phenocines are a shared resource within the biofilm. Um, have you looked or found cheaters in the biofilms? Yes, this is a great question. Um, so we have not done much of that. We've done a little bit. And what uh, someone in the class asked me earlier today, and the answer I gave to them is the same I'll give to you. Over the short term, cheat actually can do better than the producer because it is spared the metabolic cost of synthesizing it. In the long run, the cheater will never win out because over time, the community will lose the ability to make these shuttles. And these shuttles are essential for long-term survival. So I think it's a question of time in terms of the amount of benefit that a cheater might actually get. Okay, because I was thinking in some cases, uh, flow uh, helps to mitigate, you know, the, the effect uh, or the benefit that some cheaters could get. But here it sounds like DNA could trap. That's it. Right? Yeah, that's it. That's why the DNA is so essential is because none of this would work if you had a flowing regime and they were just diffusive, they have to be trapped. The diffusion has to be slowed down or else there's no possibility of um, maintaining a metabolic benefit. Great, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Um, I'm, I wonder, you have given us a, a splendid um, overview of uh, pyrocinin and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And you also mentioned that DNA specific binding specificity is important. But you also say that phenacins have a role in, in biofilm formation and also in the rhizosphere. But I wonder if these are other uh, mechanisms of being specific, because um, the only bacteria that you know that produces pyrus and in pseudomonas originosa. Other penicillins, well, PCA is, is yes, all over yes, yes. the place. So it's only uh, important, uh, let's say, in cystic fibrosis um, for also making all these uh, clumps of pseudomonas and okay. putting all Thank you so much for asking this question. So um, this is precisely the um, direction we're going now is to broaden out from pseudomonas originosa and its phenazines into other pseudomonads that make phenazines. Uh, what I want to say is that another group, um, they're now uh, in Texas, um, uh, the Pearsons, uh, Leland Pearson um, and his uh, partner, Sandy, uh, they have worked with pseudomonas oreophasians uh, that makes um, to hydroxyphenazine, which is a beautiful orange phenazine. And they have found that it promotes biofilm development also for that strain. We're now embarking upon a program to very systematically compare multiple phenazine producers that make different phenazines and ask, does it help all of them or only some? And why or why not? And we have some very specific ideas that should allow us to predict which ones will be able to benefit in the way I've described for this and which ones won't. And that's a great question for the future, yeah. Thank you for your nice talk. I really enjoy it. Um, my question is about the use of phenacines by others. I mean, because the biofilm is, I mean, it's a mix of many bugs, yes. not only uh, pseudomonas, the natural ones. So what do you think about that? Yes. So this is the whole part of the uh, talk that I, I didn't have a chance to 
uh, get to because of uh, running out of time. But this is what we're really interested in is multi-species interactions around phenazines. And so we have um, begun to work towards looking at when you have a community, everything I showed you was with a population. But when you have a community, how does phenazine production affect different members? And so the way that we are going forward into this is that we, working with Linda from these uh, uh, rhizospheres of wheat, we isolated 100 different bacteria that have been evolving with the phenazine producers in this habitat. And we sequenced all of their genomes, and uh, they're all genetically tractable. And we have now a spectrum of these isolates that we can pick from to make a synthetic community, some of which are very sensitive, others of which are very resistant. And we know their genomes, and we can do genetics. And so where we're starting to work towards is to be able to image over time how uh, their development of spatial associations with each other changes if you have a phenazine producer in their midst. Um, and, and how does it change as a function of the local oxygen concentration? And, and we have some hypotheses, but we can try to disprove them in this system and see it's a nice experimental system to begin to look at the broader effects on the community. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so thank you again <laughs> for your talk. Um, um, I'm wondering about the phenotype that you showed us um, regarding, well, when you use this enzyme that you discovered that could, um, like, let's say, de degradate phenocytes, uh, you show that it killed, um, well, the, the cells in the biofilm. So it's similar as the, to the phenotype that you showed us in class in which you mutate the phenocyte machinery so there is no phenocytes. However, the phenotype is different because when you did that mutant, there was this pattern biofilms. And in this case, I'm not sure. Like, I wanted to know if with if using this enzyme that also degradates phenocytes, and so at the end, you don't have it in the biofilm yeah, yeah. if they're forming the patterns. Great. OK, so very good observation. So what I showed you right now was after the biofilm had developed, OK, that it already developed. And then I add this inhibitor so they can no longer cycle it, what the impact is. That's a different experiment from asking what happens if I add this inhibitor at the beginning and how does that affect their ability to make a biofilm, which is similar to what I showed in class with mutants. The phenotype is similar if I add it at the beginning. It inhibits biofilm development. Yeah. It's just that in many chronic infections, the biofilm's already there. And so the more um, practically relevant thing is, well, what happens? How do you treat an established biofilm? And so that's why the data for this I was showing was from a later stage of could it allow us to more effectively treat them with antibiotics? And it's actually a different mechanism why it's working at this stage than the mechanism that prevents biofilm uh, maturation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I was wondering, uh, considering the existence of that kind of uh, tolerant bacteria, uh, have you ever wondered if the explanation that you found um, that the resistance of that bacteria uh, could be related of the cross uh, link resistance that the bacteria could have to some species of, I don't know, maybe antibiotics and uh, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, species of um, um, other compounds like tertiary compounds or something like that. So I think if, let me make sure I'm understanding your question. I, I believe you're asking whether or not the ability of these bacteria to also tolerate other synthetic antibiotics is linked to machinery that they use to manage their own antibiotic if there is a connection. Is that your question? 
Yes, the answer is absolutely yes. And so we recently published a paper about this where we showed that this, um, and this is really important, that because they are producing their own natural antibiotics, part of what they need to do to manage the toxicity of their own natural products is that they have a variety of defenses against them. And some of these defenses include efflux pumps that are able to expel the drug from the cell more quickly than it can react with things it's not supposed to react with inside the cell. So what we showed was that the very same efflux system that takes these phenazines recognizes very important aminoglycosides like ciprofloxacin um, and gentamicin. And that's one of the reasons why you have you know, such a synergy is that the ability to process the natural antibiotic also confers the ability to get rid of the synthetic drug that is recognized by the same transporter. So one of the recommendations for clinical practice is before you give an antibiotic to a patient, you want to know what are the natural antibiotics present in the system. And you wanna avoid giving a drug that is going to be recognized by the same machinery that recognizes the natural antibiotic. So very good question. Thank you, uh, Diane, for your talk. Uh, my question is more about uh, if there is any process for selecting uh, which bacteria will generate or will bacteria release their, D the, their DNA to form the network, yeah. DNA network. And you mentioned that uh, when you inhibit the production of phenacine, mm -hmm. the biofilm uh, mm -hmm. was not in the, mm -hmm. was not, in fact, there was not a biofilm, right? Uh, if I was wondering if there's one process for selecting which bacteria are responsible for, for that process. Yeah, actually, um, I believe the answer is already out there based on the work of Cynthia Whitchurch. So she did this when she was in Australia. She's now um, in the UK. And what she was doing, she was the first person who demonstrated that eDNA is present in a pseudomonas biofilm. And so she has been studying um, how does the eDNA get there for a long time. And what she showed is that, uh, and this is the heterogeneity of the population. That's, I think, what single cell work is showing us is how heterogeneous each of these cells are, even in a very small spatial uh, distance from each other. What she demonstrated is that certain of these cells uh, wind up um, having what's called a, a piacin be released when they experience oxidative stress. So a piacin is related to a bacteriophage. It's not a full phage, but it's like a phage. It's a, a set of proteins that when they're expressed, they wind up poking a hole in the cell membrane and it causes the contents of the cell to be released, including the DNA. And so when the cells experience oxidative stress, certain members of the population trigger their piacin. What we are now connecting and adding to her work is that the oxidative stress that is being experienced is being enhanced by the phenazines for the reasons I was talking about in class, the ability of the reduced phenazines to quickly transfer electrons to oxygen and generate superoxide, which then triggers the release of uh, the piacin. So that's how they're starting to come together. You can have piacins that are also triggered by oxidative stress that don't require phenazines. Phenazines just amplify it. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, I was wondering if um, do cyclic DGMP uh, is involved in the regulation of the production of phenazines? Because at least what I understood is that um, the production of phenazines is a process that takes place not in the early stages of the formation of biofilm, but rather like in the middle late stages. That's right, it totally does. So cyclic DIGMP is one of the most important secondary messengers necessary for biofilm development. In fact, it controls the production of the exopolysaccharide PEL. And it turns out that phenazine production winds up being sensed by a transcription factor that winds up setting the amount of cyclic DIGMP in the cell. And that in turn impacts the ability to make the matrix. And so 
uh, it's really neat because there's this competition between the matrix of the pill and the piocyanin and the phenazines for eDNA. And so what happens is that the piocyanin winds up repressing PEL biosynthesis because otherwise it wouldn't be able to intercalate into the eDNA as well. So there's this really uh, dramatic phenotype we see when we delete um, the phenazine biosynthesis genes. We find, as I showed the class, the, the uh, cells wind up spreading out and making these big towers. And that's because they can make a lot more of this polysaccharide. Because in that case, the only way they can survive is to access oxygen. However, when they make phenazines, they're able to inhabit this interior world of the biofilm because they're cycling the phenazine. But they're only able to cycle the phenazines efficiently if they bind to the eDNA. And so there is a very clear molecular connection between the cyclic DIGMP secondary messenger inducing the genes for the biosynthesis of the polysaccharide and phenazines. They all are interacting in a way that really has a nice logic that makes a lot of sense. He says, thank you very much for your talk. I would like to know if there is any protective effect against PYO toxicity in the producer cells. Yes, so the producer cells are protected against PYO toxicity because uh, PYO or PYO um, winds up inducing the systems for its own efflux. Okay, and in addition to that, that's the primary mode of protection. It comes from managing transport systems. Um, in addition, uh, the bacteria that make these phenazines have an arsenal of other um, uh, defenses, including enzymes like superoxide dismutase and catalase that are able to um, help mitigate the unintended reactive oxygen species that will arise in the cell when phenazines are being made and reduced. So those are some of the most important determinants of uh, resistance is efflux and management within the cell to chaperone them. And we have some emerging evidence at the subcellular level that there are proteins that really keep the phenazines close to where they're made and then quickly transported so they can't you know, react indiscriminately in the cytosol. Um, but that's part of it, but also just having these enzymes that sop up oxidative stress. Hi, thank you very much for this uh, very impressive talk. And I'm sure less is more because of this nice discussion. Here. No, it's amazing. Your <laughs> questions are phenomenal. Yeah, thank you. That's very, very useful. And then um, I would like to ask um, if you think that uh, one of the reasons why many bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, inhabiting soils, for example, Salmonas, but also Stenotropomonas and many others have so many uh, R&D R &D, uh, efflux paths. Yeah. Could this be required to yeah. survive in polymicrobial communities producing Ab all these different, absolutely. different absolutely. types of phenazines? Yeah, and not well beyond phenazines. I mean, phenazines, like I said, are just, they're my favorite example, but I think that the general point is even broader, that there are so many of these redox active metabolites of different types. There's quinones, anthroquinones, you know, these are pyrazines, you have lots of different chemistry that um, is sharing this commonality of the ability to uh, be redox active, you know, and, and you find in communities, uh, these molecules that are being made, but they're being made at lower concentrations than are what typically kill other organisms. Um, and so, I think there's a lot of reason to think that communities have evolved ways that, at least in certain microenvironments, when soils are wet and you don't have a lot of oxygen, that they're actually serving other functions that are helping the community. There's a whole story that I didn't have time to tell you about how these molecules help the cells acquire phosphorus and iron. That's really relevant for soil environments. They're like chelating. So they don't chelate. What they do is they reductively liberate um, phosphate when it's bound From to an iron mineral. Organic compounds or whatever to minerals. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that um, there are so many of these molecules in the soil that their efflux and transport is something that has to have been evolved in the community 
in order to manage them. So it's not surprising that you find mm -hmm. these pumps all over the place. Uh -huh. And have you found a um, specific induction of reflux pump low side by? We have, we yeah. have. And so we published okay, a paper you. in Floss Biology in 2021. Uh, Lucas Marias is the first author, and it is all about the induction of the MEX uh, efflux pumps by these phenazines and, and how it provides cross protection to ciprofloxacin and other um, fluoroquinolones. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Ah, thank you. So I was thinking that um, the, the eDNAs e that uh, retain the Penicillins, uh -huh. uh, so I was thinking that maybe uh, is it possible to deliver DNAs? That's such a great question. Uh, uh, yeah. So if you deliver DNAs like into the middle of the the uh -huh. biofilm, uh, you may reduce the population of those. Uh, it's I think a fantastic idea. I you have just very much the right thought there. Um, the problem is, and we tried this actually, it was one of the first things we did was we added DNAs to our biofilm and we thought, oh, you know, this should really mess it up. Um, and, and it does, it messes it up a lot. But part of the reason it messes it up is that the buffer that you need to add for the DNAs to be active on its own, it causes unintended effects. And so for practical reasons, it was actually kind of impossible to do that experiment. Um, although we, to the established biofilm, I could show you data and it's published in a paper I can tell you about later, where we added DNAs. Um, actually, we and this other uh, friend of mine in Australia, they were doing similar experiments. And when they added DNAs really early in the process of biofilm development, they showed that the DNAs stopped biofilm development, which makes sense, right? If the DNA, at least in the beginning, is a substrate to climb, that should, if you get rid of it, they shouldn't be able to climb and make a, a little biofilm. We saw the same thing happen when we added our, you know, piocyanin enzyme that degrades it. And when we added the DNAs and the piocyanin together, we got the same effect. It wasn't additive, it was the same, which reinforced the idea that they're in the same pathway, that the, the phenazine triggers the DNA, and then that's what's necessary. So if you get rid of the phenazine, or you get rid of the DNA, you should in both cases block it early on. That's what we saw, and that's what this other group also saw. When we added the DNA, when the biofilm was really established later, for technical reasons, it was difficult to get it to penetrate, you know, just selectively where we want it. So we haven't been able to do that experiment. That's a great idea. Uh, hi, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my question goes uh, a little bit in that direction. Um, have you studied uh, the microecology of biofilm? Because I was wondering if this kind of eDNA is important in other processes. For example, this case is just phenazine, but maybe you have nutrients or other molecules that you can have. And I was wondering also if um, in this kind of competition, you could have DNAs or other proteins or things that can compete with other biofilms, like when you get to two different species? Yes, okay. So what um, uh, you sh can uh, do if you search on biofilms and eDNA is you'll find reviews that talk about the role of eDNA in biofilms. And so this was established, like I said, first by Cynthia Whitchurch, who was the first person to observe. The yeah, human? EDNA. What? <laughs> that there's eDNA in the matrix. And then following that, that discovery was in 2000. So like almost 24 years ago. Then a lot more labs started studying it and they found that different species, not just Pseudomonas also make eDNA. Um, and people saw that eDNA could be a nutrient. People like bacteria can start eating DNA if they run out of carbon. Um, but no one had ever showed that until our work that there was a role for it in facilitating electron transfer in some way. So that was our contribution. But it had already been established that eDNA was a scaffold for building a, and, and could be a nutrient. Others, I think, even showed that it could be a source of you know, genes for tran natural transformation in biofilms. Um, but I think it could be doing a lot more and binding a lot more small molecules and even binding proteins. 
we, we don't yet know what all the interactions are, but now we know we should start to look for them. So I hope in the future that we and many other labs will start to have a better sense of what the chemistry of the matrix is really like, because I think it's knowable and I think it's very important in understanding these communities, whether it's a single population or multiple, multiple species. Thanks for the talk. Uh, well, I was wondering, um, the experiments were made with biofilm with only one species, right? Right. So from what I've read, biofilms are in the wild, very diverse. They have very, a lot of different species of bacteria. So I was wondering if we yeah. made these same exper experiments with yeah. I, in the wild, hmm, biofilm with more bacteria, yeah. will we see different results maybe affect, affected by other bacteria yeah. that might introduce other things? I, I think absolutely we likely will. And that's what it, we're just now starting to do actually in my lab is these experiments with multiple species that um, as I it was explaining to answer someone's question earlier, uh, we have isolated because they're from the same natural ecosystem, the same niche. So we think that they're ecologically important organisms to look at in a community to see how a fenazine producer in that community affects the development. So in a couple of years, I'll be able to give you a better answer to your question. I don't know now, we're just starting it, but we have some expectations of, of how they will affect them based on what we understand provides uh, fenazine tolerance or not. Uh, we can look at their genomes and we can predict which ones should respond in particular ways. So we're going to see what happens when we put them together. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Bien, yo creo que la dejamos acá. Muchas gracias, Ayan, por tu presentación. Y si alguien tiene una pregunta, se puede acercar a ella mientras yeah. recoge sus, sus yeah. gracias, gracias a ustedes por tantas preguntas tan buenas.